welcome to the Grand Prix cap for the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix here on the Five Red Lights F1 podcast. My name is Aaron Harper, and in this episode, I'll be sharing my thoughts on the race at Imola, giving you the story of the weekend, rating the race, and every driver's performance. I'll also be discussing the first sprint race of 2022. This podcast can be found on most podcast platforms such as Spreaker, Apple, Spotify, and Google. You can find it on YouTube as well, along with other videos such as The Flying Lap, where I review the race and the headlines faster than the pole position lap time. Like, follow, or subscribe wherever you're watching or listening. And if you could be kind enough to rate the podcast on Apple or Spotify, or just do it with a YouTube comment, that would be hugely appreciated. You can follow me on social media at five underscore red underscore lights on Twitter and five road lights on Instagram. I also have a blog site where I write F1 articles, giving my thoughts on various F1 things as well as my predictions for every race weekend. You can find it at www.5roadlights.wixsite.com forward slash 5RL pod blog. So let's get into the Emilia Romagna Grand Prix cap. It was, of course, a sprint format weekend, which meant we had qualifying on Friday, uh, then a sprint on Saturday ahead of the Grand Prix. Um, and we lost one of the practice sessions, which, um, well, I'll get into that a little bit later when I speak about uh, the sprint as a whole. So let's begin with the Friday morning or Friday mid after midday running because it was I think it was afternoon actually in Imola wasn't it? Um, so it began with a wet track and the first chance to see drivers tackle such conditions in the new cars in a competitive session. There was a couple of early spins for Charles Leclerc at Varianti Alta and Aqua Minerali, and there were several drivers ex- exploring the Imola extremities given the uh, wet conditions. Red Bull and Ferrari appeared very close on pace, as many had predicted. Um, But however, Ferrari unleashed searing pace on the Inters. Leclerc topping the session by uh, eight tenths of a second from teammate Carlos Sainz. So the Tifosi were in a pretty bullish mood, I would imagine, heading into qualifying. And the qualifying session started Friday evening in drying conditions with the Alfa Romeos actually the first team out on the slicks as everyone else sort of explored on the Inters. It was a stop-start qualifying session. There was a record five red flags. Um, I know this is the five red lights podcast, but this was the five red flags qualifying session. So let's just go through each culprit of uh, a red flag. So we had Alex Albon with a brake fire and subsequent explosion of the brake drum. Um... Very similar to what happened to Nicholas Latifi in testing in Bahrain, where the the brake disc and the brake drum just seemed to eat itself, basically, and that was the end of his session, so he was condemned to being at the back for the second race in a row. Then the major red flag incident, which was Carlos Sainz crashing at Rivazza 2. He was second fastest, he was trying to improve, I don't think he was actually improving on the lap, but he said that it was a mistake that he didn't really see coming. He didn't think he was pushing to the point of a mistake. But the car got away from him. It hit the barrier on the outside of uh, Rivazza 2. So that was the end of his session. And the best he would be was 10th for the sprint. Doubly bad news because he signed a new contract. And he needs a victory. Kevin Magnussen, he slid off at Aqua Minerali, but he managed to keep going. And there was some there was some debate about whether the FIA had been too hasty in uh, throwing the red flag, considering that K-Mag did get going, but it took him a little while. And the way the conditions were, you, you could see that he was still in the car. So yes, you could cover it under double, double wave yellows, um, but still the cars, it's very tricky to like in that in that moment stop someone doing it. I mean, they're all professionals and they they get told that there's a, a double wave yellow at a certain corner, so they should all know to lift off. But trying to lend that speed off at that part of the track might have been a bit tricky. So I can see why they threw the red, but in the end they didn't really need to because Magnussen managed to get himself going again. I think if you can see that the driver is actively getting out of the car um, or has switched it off, then yes, absolutely, throw the red flag. But um, if, if the engine's still running, there's a chance that he could get going again. So just cover it under double-weighed yellows. 
um, or throw a, a virtual safety car because then that that means that we don't have this strange what well, I say strange this big gap in um, the the session which then sort of holds everybody up. Uh, Bottas he uh, caused a red flag because he had an exhaust issue and stopped at the side of the track and his Alfa Romeo needed recovering. And Lando Norris, uh, once everyone had got back out there, also slid off at Aqua Minerale and hit the barrier and that curtailed the session. So there was a lot of drama in Q2 because rain was inbound, um, but before it actually hits, science hit the wall at Revazza 2, causing a fairly lengthy stoppage. And as the stoppage was in progress and the Ferrari was being recovered, the aforementioned rain fell and it confirmed both Mercedes elimination. Uh, Russell 11th and Hamilton 13th, the first time since the 2012 Japanese Grand Prix that no Mercedes car has got into Q3. So that just shows you where they were. And Mercedes have struggled to get the car set up well after one practice session. They've needed practice two and practice three to really find the sweet spot of that car. And a sprint format weekend really hurt them because after FP1, the cars went into Park Ferme, which something that could potentially be looked at in terms of a sprint weekend but again I'll, I'll, we'll get onto that later in Q3 more red flags uh, and it really stops anyone gaining momentum but Verstappen timed his run correctly to set the 1 minute 27.999 uh, which was good enough for pole position and he beat Charles Leclerc in the remaining Ferrari to the fastest lap time uh, Lando Norris and Kevin Magnussen did enough despite both of them sliding off Aqua Minerali to line up on the second row of the grid for the sprint uh, ahead of Alonso and Ricardo, who both beat Sergio Perez who could only manage 7th in that stop-start session Bottas 8th, Vettel 9th uh, and then there was Sainz in 10th so it was Verstappen and Leclerc on the front row again uh, for the second, third time this season uh, and it was for the first sprint of 2022. So let's look at the story of how that panned out. The lights went out and Charles Leclerc grabs the lead as Verstappen stuttered with a gear sink issue, hampering his start. So it turns out that it was just purely too much wheel spin from the left-hand side of the track where his grid spot was. And that sort of played havoc with the gear sinks because if you get too much wheel spin, it causes a slow shift because otherwise it will wreck the gearbox. Sergio Perez in the other Red Bull jumped from 7th to 5th as Alonso went the other way with Ricardo retaining his P6 and there was a collision between Guan Yuzhou and Pierre Gasly at Piratella deploying the safety car on the opening lap. Once that went in Leclerc opened up a 1.5 second lead but his soft tyres fell away with apparent front right graining allowing Verstappen to attack and on the penultimate lap he made the overtake to secure uh, victory in the sprint. Perez recovered up to third and Sainz got himself up to fourth from his 10th place uh, starting position and that set up a mighty intriguing duel between the Red Bull and Ferrari pairs for the race. McLaren scored some more good points in the sprint with fifth and sixth. Norris ahead of Ricardo again. Bottas and Magnussen rounded out the top eight who uh, scored points. So the stage was set with Ferrari on one side of the grid and Red Bull on the other with a wet start to the Grand Prix. Now we saw a bit of chaos last year and Verstappen got a good start in 2021 to launch from third to first and it was the Red Bulls who got a good start again. Verstappen, Perez and Norris got great launches off the line and they were 1-2-3 into Tamburello. Leclerc having to concede the position to Norris having not made such a good launch himself. But there was more drama for Carlos Sainz as he was tipped into a spin by Daniel Ricciardo and Sainz uh, was stuck in the gravel again out of the race. Not really Ricciardo's fault and not really Sainz's fault. It was just one of those things Ricciardo got his front left wheel on the kerb and slid across the greasy track and the greasy surface and just clipped signs in the worst possible way for the Ferrari in terms of spinning it round. Yeah, it's not looking good for Carlos. He's fast becoming Mr. Unlucky in Formula 1. But then, at points, you do make your own luck. He had the pace to be potentially, well, I think if he'd qualified... 
on the front two rows, he probably would have ended up, well, he would have ended up there anyway, but he would have needed to make a better start than he did. So in that sense, you do make your own luck. Uh, but Carlos's bid for a world championship is very quickly getting away from him at this rate. So the safety car was deployed, and after that, Verstappen pulled a lead to Perez and Leclerc, who were battling over second position. A little bit further back, uh, George Russell and Kevin Magnussen scrapped over fifth, with Russell sending a move on the outside to uh, at Tamburello to make the overtake, but he actually overshot and bounced over the kerbs, but later in the lap, he snuck up the inside into Varianti Alta, which was something he'd been threatening to do uh, over the previous laps. And Ricardo was the first man in for slicks shortly after. Um, and there wasn't really much change through that pit stop phase, which was the only pit stop, really, of the race for many drivers. Everyone generally staying where they were. The big loser was uh, Lewis Hamilton because uh, Esteban Ocon was released unsafely in front of him and the Frenchman picked up a five-second time penalty. But that wasn't really any consolation to Lewis because he was stuck well and truly behind Pierre Gasly. But something that was really frustrating about this race, and I think really, really hurt it, was the lack of DRS, even on the intermediates. And I, I know that it is a tough racetrack, and the fact that the walls are so close and it's wet means you have to be cautious about certain things but my theory is that if they'd opened the DRS and allowed the drivers to attack offline with the inters it might have actually provided more opportunity once they switched to slicks because once that drying line clears up uh, you don't really want to be driving on it so one driver might have been defending on the dry line and someone else could have attacked on that inside patch into Tamburello and then that would have started clearing up and drying up too which could have potentially uh, accelerated the switch to slicks. Now if the race director feels that it's not safe then surely they shouldn't be going to slicks but you know that is what it is it was just one of those frustrating things about this race I'm not saying that my theory would have been fully correct and, and functional because once the DRS was enabled, we didn't really see that much overtaking, to be honest, even though DRS was very powerful. It wasn't enabled until like lap 34, so they would have had the first time they would have got it would have been lap 35, which in a 63 lap race, considering they'd been on the slicks maybe 15 laps by this point, that's too long. It's far too long. And yes, the the Russell and Bottas incident would have been in their in their thoughts from last season, but the the hasty red flags and the lack of DRS, the FIA are and look, they're well within their rights to be uh cautious about certain things, but they were being over cautious this weekend. They were being far too quick with the red flag in terms of allowing Magnussen a chance to recover. Obviously, if you can see a car is completely beached in a qualifying or a practice session, throw a red. Absolutely. But you don't need to keep throwing red flags. You don't need to keep being overly cautious because it's just going to drive people away. They're going to think, well, are they really racing or are they just waiting to be told it's, you know, I don't know. It was just very, very annoying. Unfortunately, once the DRS was enabled, nothing really changed. And the epitome of that was Lewis Hamilton, because he got lapped, and he was totally stuck behind Pierre Gasly, who wasn't fast enough to pass Alex Albon's Williams, even with the DRS. And Albon didn't have DRS for much of that, and Gasly couldn't get by, Hamilton therefore couldn't get by, and it just became a slightly torturous... Uh, watch for fans of Lewis and fans of Mercedes. Now back at the front, Leclerc had done everything he could to force a mistake from Perez, who'd actually made a little excursion across the Varianti Alta grass, and this was before the, the DRS was enabled on lap 29, and Charles couldn't make the pass. Even with the DRS he couldn't get close enough, and then he 
decided to box on lap 50 for soft tyres, Ferrari going for the fastest lap point. Perez responded on the next lap to try and deny Leclerc. Now as they were all going for this extra point, that fastest lap, Leclerc makes a massive, massive error. He clubbed the sausage curb at Variante Alta and spun off, damaging his front wing because he bumped the barrier on the outside. And it's the first chink in the Leclerc armour in 2022. It was was a bit of a scruffy weekend in the end because Leclerc struggled with the tyres on Saturday. He certainly had the pace to be on pole position, but he didn't put the lap together at the right time. Yeah, probably the, well, definitely the, the poorest weekend that Ferrari have had so far this season. But considering how well they've been performing so far, and the level of expectation from the Tifosi, who were all back in force, and it was a light as the cars came onto the grid, it was a wonderful backdrop with the Ferrari flags and the the red smoke and the, all the red caps and just a sea of people on the bank of grass and the hill behind the start line. Wonderful, wonderful view. Reminds you of a, of a full Silverstone uh, on a warm summer day or uh, the the Dutch crowd at Zandvoort last year. You know, it's, re- it's really, really great when you see in the background the the fans out in force supporting maybe one team or all of the teams. That is really good for Formula 1 to see that the people are they're ready to part with their money, their hard-earned money, to come and watch uh, a Formula 1 race. Now Leclerc's error did promote Lando Norris up to third and after a short pit stop, change of front wing, uh, Charles Leclerc came out in ninth and recovered up to sixth, which was, yeah, I mean, really... It, it was sixth when it should have been third, and it could have been second, because I don't think he would have really had the pace to challenge Verstappen over a race distance, uh, especially considering Verstappen's uh, prowess in the wet. So the checkered flag falls, Verstappen wins, leading a Red Bull 1-2, and Max and Red Bull charge back into the title fight. The lead is down to 27 points at the top of the driver's standings. Uh, Verstappen up into second. Perez leaping ahead of uh, Sainz, who's now failed to score twice in a row. Um, well, in Grand Prix at least, because he did pick up some points in the sprint. But that, that's a, a real shot in the arm for Red Bull after only a 50% finishing record in the opening three races. Uh, Verstappen with a double DNF so far this season. Um, obviously Perez breaking down in Bahrain as well. But with Ferrari will be disappointed. They'll 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 recover and they'll have confidence in their car. It wasn't that the car was terrible. It was just that the Red Bull was able to be set up better from that one practice session. Because after that, as I've already mentioned, that practice session, the car is going to park Fermi. So if you've got a problem in terms of front graining or rear graining, there's no way really of adjusting it, apart from maybe a change of wing angle or a few other switches that they can use on the wheel, which is kind of annoying, to be honest, because once that's all set in stone on Friday, and bear in mind they don't really do enough long running on Friday to, to find that out, once that becomes apparent on Saturday, there's no way of fixing it. So whatever problem you've got, you're stuck with, and it kind of kind of ruins the race to be honest because yes of course if if there's if friday's a washout and there's only the one practice session on a saturday morning well that's just you know that's the the racing gods playing against you you only get that one opportunity but the way the format is set up and we'll touch on this later uh when i discuss more about the sprint it doesn't it sort of forces teams to to blindly go down an alley and then they're in the lap of the race and gods as to how their setup works out. So that's the story of the weekend. Let's start rating some drivers and let's start with the championship leaders, Ferrari and Charles Leclerc. So Charles Leclerc, he started in second position. He finished in sixth and I'll rate his performance as a two. I was too greedy, Leclerc said after his mistake. He can be afforded an error. 
having built up a nice championship lead in the first three rounds. But this has got to be one of very few errors. Um, I'm surprised he didn't just come out and say that he was stupid because that that that's his line. That's his thing. Come on, Charles. It's that uh, it's that meme of say it, say it, say it. You know, you know the one I mean. So uh, it's uh, the Bart Simpson one. So yeah, we can afford him one mistake. He's still got a 27 point lead. If he doesn't finish in uh, Miami, he still walks away with at worst a one point championship lead, and then everything would be absolutely game on, um, and there'd still be there'd still be 18 races to go, which is madness, absolute madness. Let's move on to his teammate Carlos Sainz, who started in fourth place but failed to finish. So I rate Carlos's performance really as a two, kind of going off of his sprint drive, to be honest. He drove well in the sprint, tipped into a spin and, re a spin and retirement by Ricardo. Not his fault, but also extremely unhelpful to his uh, ambitions for the season. And Carlos, he'd had a new engine put in this weekend, and I think Charles is going to take a new upgraded power unit for um, Miami. There's going to be a couple of extra bits on it that they're allowed to put in. But his DNF kind of limits the amount of running that it's done. So, you know, silver linings and all that, but that's very it's very nitpicky because he does really need the points on the board, not the miles left in the engine. Although, if there's mileage left in the engine, that might come back to help him and pay dividends later in the season. As I said just a moment ago, 18 races to go after Miami. So it's just going to be... It's it could be, uh, it's, well, it's a marathon, not a sprint. So uh, there's there's some optimism for for Carlos still, but it's it's very small. Let's move on to the Mercedes pair of Lewis Hamilton and George Russell, starting with the seven-time world champion, who only started in 14th. He actually qualified 13th uh, on Friday, dropped a place in the sprint. Finished 13th, he crossed the line in 14th, promoted a place after Ocon's 5 second time penalty. I'm going to rate Lewis's performance as a 1.5. And the question is, is this his worst weekend with Mercedes? As a Lewis fan myself, uh, it was pretty torturous actually to watch it because he just seemed all at sea. And it was one of those drives where, and we've seen a few of these with like Sebastian Vettel, where the car just hasn't worked and... It's a for, it's a former champion, and it just looks like they've given up. But obviously, they haven't. They're still fighting as hard as they possibly can. They're just restricted by the amount of potential the car has on that given day. But that just shows where Mercedes are at the moment. If they can get the car right and get it in the window, they can do well, as they have done in the first three races. But this weekend was very, very difficult. I don't think they were helped by the sprint format as I've already spoken about but really 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 difficult and Lewis himself in his body language he looked really down he declared himself out of the title fight he compared the car to the 2009 McLaren he had to drive and that thing was bad that thing was really bad so yeah and it doesn't help when he was so beat so uh, comprehensively beaten by George Russell and let's talk about uh, the boy from Kings Lynn, he qualified 11th, which was uh, also where he started the race after the sprint, and he finished an incredible fourth. So I rate George's performance as a 4.5, another excellent drive from young George Russell, outperforming that car really. It's probably only really good enough for a lower points haul. But he's the only driver so far to have finished every race in the top five, and considering what he's got to drive, that is some feat. I mean, a little bit of fortune here and there, but you've got to be in the right position. And we'll talk about Lando Norris in a bit. And that's the position Lando put himself into uh, this weekend at, in Imola. So for George to deliver that result and pull a really nice pass on Kevin Magnussen in the process was just fantastic. A really, really strong drive. And, you know, we, we all know just how good George Russell is because he showed it in the Williams. But this shows that 
he's a, a young driver who Mercedes can definitely build themselves around. The big question will be, can he hang it in a title fight against Verstappen or or Leclerc or against Norris or one of the other young drivers coming through? But all of the ingredients are there and he's delivering when the, arguably the biggest team in Formula 1 are not where they want to be anymore. Let's move on to our race winner, Max Verstappen. Qualified fastest, won the sprint, started on pole position for the race, won the race, and it was a champion's drive from Verstappen, producing a grand slam performance. So he gets the full five, uh, just like Charles Leclerc did in Australia. So a second race in a row where we've handed out a rating of five out of five. I think this time it goes to Max Verstappen. Sergio Perez, his Red Bull teammate, started the race in third, made a great start to get himself up to second, which is where he finished, and a rate set Sergio's performance as a four. He did make that one tiny mistake, which I've taken half a point away from. Um, but it was a textbook rear gunner drive by Perez. He bottled up Leclerc and forced the error late on in the race. He had very good pace, but he can't match it with Verstappen in the wet. Um, just, you know... It was a it was a Sergio drive to be honest. He this is the this is the sort of performance that Red Bull hired him for because Albon and Gasly probably wouldn't have delivered this. Their confidence would have been completely destroyed uh, by now if they had stayed in the team until now. Let's move on to McLaren, and it was another really good weekend for McLaren despite only one car scoring points in the Grand Prix. They scored a double points in the sprint, and Lando Norris he started the Grand Prix from fifth finished the race in third. I rate his performance as a four as well. What a turnaround for Norris and McLaren from Bahrain. A little fortune to get the podium, but it rewarded a very high-level weekend from young Norris. Who'd have thought it, eh? The, the state that the car was in, in Bahrain, running around literally last. And now here they are in the fourth round of the, of the season on the podium. And they were there on merit. They were the third fastest car because Lando qualified the car third on Friday. Yes, wet, dry conditions, but you still have to deliver. And Lando did. That's This This game is all about timing. What the stopwatch says and getting your lap in at the right time in wet conditions. Be on the right tyres at the right time. You know, all those, all those old things. So Lando did the job. Brilliant from him. Daniel Ricciardo started sixth but finished 18th. Uh, Ray's performance is a two. His error at the start was very costly for both him and Carlos Sainz. And I've no doubt in saying that Daniel would have been probably top six without that error. Um, and it would have been another double point score for McLaren. And they'd looked very, very strong uh, had that been the case. Let's move on to Alpine and Fernando Alonso. He started ninth. He actually qualified fifth on Friday, but he failed to finish the race. Uh, Ray's performance is a 1.5. Because it can only really go off of his sprint performance, which was not very good, to be honest. Uh, he was an innocent victim, really, of Schumacher's spin at the start, which resulted in bodywork damage, which they only really found out about after the uh, safety car came in and the air got underneath it and the side pod was uh, ripped apart, basically. But for Fernando, through various uh, issues, only two points from the first four races. And if that's a trend that continues that's the trend that's going to see him walk away from Formula 1 again. His teammate Esteban Ocon uh, started 17th, having had a gearbox issue on Friday, um, but he finished 14th. He did cross the line in 11th, but the five-second time penalty dropped him back. Uh, and again, a 1.5 for Esteban. As I said, that gearbox issue really hurting him. Alpine have had a quick car, but for various reasons, they've just not made the most of it, and for the second weekend in a row, Esteban not able to access the potential of the car in the same way that Fernando Alonso was. Um, yes, he was hampered by a gearbox issue, but that that car was capable of more. We saw it in Australia that when Alonso crashed in Q3, Ocon wasn't able to find the same sort of pace. So it's, it's kind of worrying times for, for Alpine and the fact that they've got Alonso who's getting uh, a lot of bad luck in some ways, but also is at the wrong end of his career to really have time for that to happen. And you've got Ocon, who 
isn't on Alonso's level in terms of pace. I wonder what would happen if they stuck a certain young Australian in that car with nothing to lose. So, just a thought. Piastri is waiting in the wings and Alpine are very keen on him for the future. Why not? Why not Piastri for 2023? Watch this space on that one. Let's head over to Alfa Romeo and Valtteri Bottas, who started in 7th and finished in 5th. He qualified 8th for the sprint, moved up a place, and then gained uh, two places through the race. And I rate his performance as a 3.5. And whatever version of Bottas we're on now, it's working. And the Finn drove really nicely, moving through the slower cars ahead of him. He seems much more freed up as a team leader, and his experience at Mercedes is really paying dividends. He's guiding that Alfa Romeo Sauber team in the right direction and just collecting the points. They're looking really, really good. His teammate, though, uh, Zhou Guan Yu, he started from the pit lane, so 20th, finished 15th. It was a tricky Grand Prix after contact with Gasly in the sprint. I rate uh, Zhou's performance as a 1.5. Let's head over to Haas and Mick Schumacher, who qualified a career best 10th. Started in the top 10 after finishing 10th in the sprint, uh, but he finished 17th. So I rate his performance as a 2. His lap 1 spin really cost him a chance to fight for points. I'm not sure he would have really been able to get them, though, because uh, the Haas seemed to lack ultimate race pace, in the dry at least. Kevin Magnussen, the Dane, started 8th, and he finished 9th, collecting more points. Another clean drive from uh, the Viking, delivering more points for Haas, who've scored in 3 out of the 4 races this season. So I rate Kevin's performance as a 3. At Alpha Tauri, let's start with Pierre Gasly, who qualified 17th and finished 12th. Uh, a rating of two for him because he was outperformed thoroughly by Yuki Snowder, but he did keep Lewis Hamilton at bay um, for what it was worth. I mean, it wasn't really worth anything in the end because they didn't get any points. But talking of points, there were points for Yuki Snowda because he qualified 12th from the sprint and he finished 7th. Rating of three for Yuki, arguably overachieved with a very tidy drive. He held off Stroll by forcing him onto the wet patch as they ran down to Rivatsa. Then he left the Canadian for, well, I won't say dust, but spray, um, and moved himself forward. He moved past Magnussen, he moved past Vettel. Uh, he did get eaten up by Leclerc on Leclerc's uh, comeback to sixth, but very nice drive from Yuki Snowder, and someone who, really, I've been underwhelmed by, because his GP2 season was, while well, it took a little while to get going, it was, not, not GP2, Formula 2. <laughs> um, his Formula 2 season, a couple of years ago, was very good, very strong towards the end, and I expected a lot last year, but he didn't get it together, and the opening rounds of this season, again, he looked like he was languishing behind Gasly, but this weekend, he had the measure of his French teammate, which bodes well, and there was no incidents either for, for Sonoda, considering all the changeable conditions, that's uh, a thumbs up as well. Williams now, and Nicholas Latifi, 19th at the start, 16th at the end, 1.5 his rating, at the back, unnoticed for much of the weekend. Uh, at least he didn't crash again. But starting to be some significant question marks over his... Uh, I wouldn't say competence, but his level of performance in Formula 1. The only thing I would say against him being just a pay driver is when the Williams last year was in a good spot, he did pick up some points finishes. Yes, they needed a little bit of... Uh, Bowling Bottas luck in Budapest to um, to achieve that for, for Latifi, but you know you put him in that position, he can deliver with a good car. Alexander Albon he started 18th and he finished 11th, so I rate his performance as a two. Uh, another very polished performance from Albon, close to a repeat of the Melbourne points, but really the ultimate pace wasn't really there. He never really looked like he was going to move anywhere further forward from um, behind Ocon and he was pretty much bottling up Gasly and Hamilton because he was out of position but it was just so tricky to overtake so that was kind of his saving grace I think on a wider track on a different day maybe he uh, probably loses those two positions and drops down the order and we'll round off with Aston Martin who picked up a double points finish at Sebastian Vettel he started the race 18th and finished it uh, sorry he started it 13th and finished it in 8th um, 
So I rate uh, Seb's performance as a three. There's life in the old dog yet. Yeah, you know, a lot of people have been saying that after his Australian antics, he should just call it a day at the end of the season or just, you know, walk away now. Um, but Aston Martin looked a lot better at Imola and Seb delivered arguably more than the car had in terms of raw pace because he qualified ninth in the sprint and then dropped back to 13th. Uh, maybe that was tyre wear. Maybe that was, who knows? I haven't really read too much into that. But certainly an improved Grand Prix pace for Seb. I think the Aston Martin looked a lot more at home in the wet conditions and considering how difficult it was to overtake once you had track position a driver like Seb would have been able to hold on to it and let's finish off the driver ratings with Lance Stroll who started the race 15th and finished it in 10th a gain of five positions just like his teammate uh, for Lance and I rate his performance as a 2.5 very tidy from Lance and collects a first point of the season for it as always that's my opinion on everyone's weekend. Let me know uh, if you feel any different about it. You can tweet me. You can leave a comment on Instagram. You can uh, you can leave a comment on the YouTube. Uh, or you can, I don't know, find another way of communicating with me. Semaphore, something like that. It's up to you. But if you think I've overrated somebody, let me know. If you think I've been too harsh then let me know as well. Now then, let's rate the race as a whole. I gave it a 5 out of 10. As much as I love Imola, it was a hard watch. Obviously, a lack of victory fight didn't really help. Uh, but with the long lack of DRS, midfield battling on the slicks was very few and far between. Had the DRS been enabled on the inters, we could have had much more action on the slicks. A shame, because the cars ran closely, regularly, and the DRS was powerful in the sprint so it might have just been a few drive-bys but at least we would have got a little bit more action and it might have seen certain cars move further forward you might have seen a bit more of what Hamilton was able to produce in clear air there were some good fights Magnussen and Russell for instance and we spent a long time following Hamilton's torturous attempts to pass Pierre Gasly um, which were ultimately unsuccessful overall though Red Bull had a pace advantage this weekend which really took the game away from Ferrari especially when it was a single horse against two bulls. Now, I did ask for some other ratings, and there wasn't too many this week, uh, but Tom Downey from Everything F1, he gave the race a 6 out of 10. He described it as a bit of a wet flannel, that one. Had some good moments, but lulled quite a bit. Carl King from uh, the Monkey Seat podcast gave it a 5 out of 10 as well. Dull, race directors worried a little too much about DRS. It wasn't really a race, and they didn't go racing. And uh, Jawad Yakub from Hit the Apex podcast, he gave the race a 6 out of 10 as well. Of course, let us know, let me know what you uh, think of the race and how much was Ferrari's strategy compromised by Science's DNF, uh, which really stopped them challenging Verstappen by doing something different. How much of an effect do you think that had or would Verstappen have had the pace regardless? So the final section of this podcast is about the sprint, and I think we should discuss it maybe maybe a bit more deeply with a proper podcast. So I'm going to give my own uh, opinions here. And I had a good chat with uh, Ash from the Outside Line on Twitter. So if you scroll through my Twitter feed, you'll be able to uh, see that um, and see our opinions on that. So the sprint race on Saturday was it was quite interesting, actually. And these are my thoughts on it post-race and but post sprint before the Grand Prix and they haven't really changed to be honest post Grand Prix the battle at the front between the front pair was fun but it also had an air of inevitability about it bearing in mind the power of the DRS and how much Leclerc's Ferrari had just eaten its tyres and this goes back to the Park Fermi issue I mean Leclerc didn't really ever get a chance to challenge Verstappen in the race but had had that been the the sole deciding factor, yes, you can say, yes, that's racing, but also we want to see the best possible Grand Prix. So allowing, you know, maybe they, maybe the teams are given uh, like an hour, an hour and a half to make an amount of changes, which are, out, which are uh, like outside of Park Fermi before the cars go back into Park Fermi. So the drivers have to be very specific on what they want changed. If there's a specific problem, can fix it 
but you only get an hour and a half to do it and then the car has to be put back together in that time ahead of the Grand Prix just maybe a suggestion there there's lots of different things that you know I think can be done to improve the the viability of a, of a sprint race now of course as I said all of that is part of racing and Verstappen deserved the victory in the sprint because he made the overtake the first overtake for the lead um, after losing the lead in the sprint uh, it still wasn't easy as it took several laps to get it to stick and the frustrating thing I think was the comments that Ross Braun made after the session now George Russell who finished the sprint in 11th having been stuck in Sebastian Vettel's DRS train for much of the 21 lap race admitted he wasn't a major fan of the format the Mercedes driver suggested that the sprint should be 50% longer Braun's rebuttal to this was every driver who's had a bad car has complained about it in the race so I think George's opinion or the opinion of anyone at the back of the grid is not the opinion that we really listen to the opinions we listen to are the guys who are really competitive they're racing in the middle racing at the front that's a worrying thing to say essentially disregarding the input of those who are not at the front of the field and Braun did go on to say he was pleased with the race as I'm sure were fans of Red Bull Ferrari and McLaren their teams picked up a load of points but if you're, say, a Williams fan or an Aston Martin fan, you've got nothing for it. You know, it's... it's Yes, it's a race. And we should be rewarding drivers who do well. Absolutely, that is how sport works. And at the end of the day, only the top 10 drivers in the Grand Prix score points. But there's a whole Grand Prix distance to, to earn that. You know, it's not a case of let's say you, you jump to the front with a good start in the sprint and then there's a safety car which you know takes out seven or eight laps you know if, if that happens at Monaco you, you've gained so many positions and yes you still have to keep the car out of the wall but have you really earned that I mean that, that's a, that's another different debate but I think Russell's basis for these extra laps was based on everyone driving flat out and there not being enough variance in lap time for anyone to make the overtake. And the midfield action had just started getting a bit more interesting as tyres began to fall apart and the DRS train began to break up. But then the chequered flag fell. And it's really disappointing to hear Ross Braun speak like that about drivers and teams at the back, essentially saying they don't matter. And, you know these drivers they're professional racing drivers they all know what's what and they all have equal say and unfortunately Formula 1 seem to get themselves with their heads in the sand and they don't listen to the fans about these sort of things they're seemingly not listening to half the grid about these issues you know, to, to go back to Saudi Arabia when the drivers had that hourly meeting about whether to race or not, that put a lot of pressure on the FIA and Formula One. And I think they probably haven't taken very well to it. And, you know, it's probably hardly surprising. But, like I've said before, the drivers are the product. If you don't have drivers, as Will Buxton would say, if you don't have a driver, no one can drive the car. So, it's just, you've got to toe the line. You've got to, yes, of course, listen to the drivers at the front because they're the ones who are competing for the big points in the sprint. But also, you know, George Russell wants to score points in the sprint. Sebastian Vettel wants to score points in the sprint. Pierre Gasly wants to score points in the sprint. Alex Albon wouldn't mind scoring a point in the sprint. It's, it's all about perception. And the way Ross Braun has come across here isn't a good look. He probably has had conversations with other drivers and they've probably been a bit more constructive, but Formula 1 does need to be open to criticism. I suppose a question we should ask is, was Imola a sensible venue, sensible venue to host a sprint? Probably not, considering how tricky overtaking was due to the narrow track, but it also was helpful in terms of showing us how well the, the new cars can follow and on a track with maybe three or four meters extra width each side perhaps then you know 
we could get a bit more overtaking. Let's say we go to Barcelona and cars are passing each other left, right and centre, everyone's going to consider it a massive success. So it's all about where you choose these sprint races to be held. If the, the race in Spain in this year is a very exciting race with lots of overtaking, maybe that's a venue to host the sprint at. So they've got to be, obviously that they've got to experiment and etc, but they must also listen to the drivers. We should also ask ourselves, was the sprint race a good race in its own right? Or was it just a consequence of a qualifying session held in variable conditions? Yes, Perez and Sainz offered up most of the action as they came through, but they were out of position. Perez in 7th, Sainz in 10th. Apart from that, there wasn't really a great deal going on. Everyone was kind of stuck in a DRS train and there was not really enough variety in in tyre choice or tyre performance until like maybe Charles Leclerc using up his tyres too much Sebastian Vettel dropped back down the order eventually but he spent a long time in the sprint race ahead of Mick Schumacher bottling up those behind him Kevin Magnussen and Mick Schumacher were one of, were two of three drivers to go on the mediums, I think the other was Latifi but he was kind of irrelevant to be honest at, at that point and that they dropped. Well, they did. Well, Schumacher didn't make progress. Magnussen uh, fell back, but stayed in the top eight. And I wonder what would a full Grand Prix with that qualifying order have looked like? How would it have allowed the possible stories to unfold? Would they have unfolded in a more satisfying fashion? And the sprint, it does have a place in Formula One, but its function and its place within the weekend flow considering the cars are in Parc Ferme from the middle of Friday. It's a delicate balance. Ross Braun and Formula One, they must be open to criticism and hear the opinions of all the teams and drivers and, crucially, the fans equally if this sprint concept is going to become a success and a mainstay of Formula One. The chequered flag is waving and that means the end of another episode. Thank you so much for joining me today. I hope you enjoyed my recap of the race weekend. The next Grand Prix cap will be for the first ever Miami Grand Prix. Remember to like the episode wherever you find it and if you could rate the podcast on Apple or Spotify I'd love to hear your feedback and I'd be so thankful uh, for your rating. Hopefully I'll be back next week with another episode but if not check out my website and also find my weekend reports on f1chronicle.com for now, though, enjoy whatever racing you watch next weekend. I believe there is Formula E and IndyCar for us to all enjoy. So enjoy that, and I will see you when the five red lights go out.